Hey everybody, this is uh, another session dealing with anatomy and physiology and what I kind of want to get into today is I want to talk about the issues of the body. Um, we'll look at several slides that actually come from a textbook. We might look at some actual uh, slides taken from some sample tissues. Now, I know for some of you guys, you're going to look at this and you're you're probably, especially the people that are in my classes, you're going to look at the slides that I'm using and you're going to say, well, wait a minute. What happened to the slides that you said you were going to use for the test? Well, I need you to just calm down for a minute, slow up for just a second. Because if you can recognize the structures that I'm going over in these slides from these notes, then you can pretty much recognize any tissue slide. And I want to kind of train your brain and train your eyes. Tissue identification can be extremely difficult. First of all, just because it's, sometimes it's kind of difficult figuring out what in the world you're actually looking at. But when you get past that, when you start really realizing what you're actually looking at, I would probably say the most difficult thing to a person's eyes um, is the fact that by habit, by habit, the human eye wants to fix on something that it's familiar with. So if you don't familiarize yourself with what structures are actually in different types of tissue, it doesn't matter what images you use on a tissue identification exam, you're going to bomb it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some very basic images because those people in my classes, they'll tell you, that the images that I'm using on the test are, are a little bit more difficult to identify with than the ones that I'm going to show you. Um, but if, you, if I'm going to show you the very basic things that you should be looking for, when you're looking at a tissue sample, and it'll help you to identify stuff um, without much hassle, much drama, you got to know what you're looking for. So no matter who's giving you an, a, a tissue identification exam, you'll be able to figure out exactly what it is that you're looking at. Because that's, that's the bottom line. If you can't tell simple squamous epithelium from simple columnar epithelium, then the bottom line is you don't know what you're looking at. You don't know the keys. And, oh, for goodness sake, if you can't tell simple squamous epithelium from skeletal muscle cells, then you really, you know, hit ground zero. Now, if this is your first time ever looking at any of the tissues, then, granted, you, you know, you get a, a, a brief period of grace. But if you've been looking and staring at these images for days, hours, um, and you still can't tell the difference between some of them, then that's when you want to drop back and punt and start really taking an inventory of, okay, what is it do I that I think I see? So let me tell you what's really there, and hopefully I'll be able to help you identify what it is that you think you see. Now, as always, I'm about to bring this file off of my Google Drive, so things might you know freeze on you a little bit or, or look a little weird as it's loading the notes but don't freak out because uh, I'm just bringing this stuff up so that you can see some basic things. And, and really what you have to start off with is you have to understand that tissues break down into four classifications, epithelial tissue, tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. With nervous tissue, we only talk about one nervous tissue, and that's nervous tissue. So um, nervous tissue is easy to identify. We'll talk about that in this lesson as well. Muscular tissue, we only talk about three different types. I know some people may say, oh, wait a minute, hold up. I thought there were multiple types like white and dark and no, 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 no. Uh, when we're talking about the classifications and we're talking about the types of muscle tissue, we are referring to skeletal muscle tissue, um, cardiac muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and two of the biggest things that allow you to be able to figure out those three tissues are their locations and uh, the, the actual, you know, um, appearance, physical appearance of the muscle cells, like the striations and uh, the, the actual physical structure of that muscle cell. Connective tissue and epithelial tissue should be the two most difficult because, you know, no offense, there's a whole lot of them. It's just classifications, but they're, you know, the types of each one 
kind of filter down. So let's take the first one. All right. Now, with epithelial tissue, what you have to understand is that epithelial tissue is considered um, a avascular tissue. In other words, it does not have blood vessels in it. So there's no blood flow through epithelial tissue. Another thing you need to understand is that epithelial tissue is mostly just cells. There's not a lot other, and there's not a lot of other extracellular materials that are in epithelial tissue. So you don't find um, a lot of fluid, you don't find a lot of protein fibers, you don't find a lot of matrix. You, you don't you don't find much of anything there but cells. It's kind of like going to the desert. It's kind of like walking out in the desert and saying, "Hey, where's all the grass?" You know, that's that's people will look at you like you were dumb. Um, depending on what desert you're in anyway. But the same thing with epithelial tissue. You don't look at epithelial tissue and say, hey, where is everything? That's epithelial tissue. It's mostly just cells. It, there's, there's not much else there. That's why the image that I have up here, you'll notice that the epithelial tissue here, um, this is stratified epithelium, and this shouldn't say stratified right here. This should actually say simple. Uh, I, I've yet to go back and change that. But this is simple and that's stratified epithelium. Um, both of them are made up of the same type of um, shape of cells. But you'll notice that this one has multiple layers and this one has one. It's simple strata it's simple epithelium because it only has one layer. Ooh, excuse me. I got a bit of yawn. It's been a long day. It's simple uh, epithelium because it's one layer. But this one at the bottom is stratified epithelium because it's multiple layers. It's, it's more than one. So a lot of times you'll see epithelial tissue in one or two categories. Uh, most of the time it's, it's either one layer or it's more than one. Then uh, when you get down to the individual cells, they have their own, uh, they have their own shapes. So if it's flat, it's squamous. If it's cube-shaped, it's cuboidal. If it's column-shaped, then it's columnar. Are, are columnar uh, epithelial cells. And the shape and the number of layers is going to dictate where it's probably going to be located. And I, like I said, when I said it was a long day, it's been a really long day. So I'm kind of, my voice is kind of leaving, so I've got some water here to try to help me out. So, um, you know, Wherever you know, actually put this epithelial tissue is going to dictate what type of shaped cells you're going to use and how many layers you're going to have. For example, uh, your skin is your skin is made up of stratified squamous epithelial cells, and the reason why it's squamous and flat is uh, because you can layer them. Um, but then again, also so that you can have the ability to send the, the ducts from sweat glands and oil glands through them. But on top of that, um, you want to be able to shed those cells because you do. You, you shed cells. That's why we have dandruff, and that's why you take a shower and you exfoliate. When people exfoliate, you're actually removing several of these layers here of dead cells so that the new living cells, fresher cells, can be pushed up to the surface. So let's uh, let's go through a few of these and let's take, check some of these out. Here's a sample of simple squamous epithelium. They've shown you an individual squamous cell over here. You can see that he's flat. What I'm talking about is actually highlighted in blue. So there's a squamous cell there at the top. Uh, he's flat. When you look at the overall tissue sample here, this area right here is all loose connective tissue. That's a type of connective tissue that you oftentimes find directly underneath epithelial tissue. Loose connective tissue usually connects epithelial tissue to the structure that that epithelial tissue is covering. So on the very surface here is just a one layer of squamous epithelium. And there it is across the top. If I had simple squamous epithelium, I would assume that it was there for the function of um, allowing um, absorption and, and secretion. Um, I, I'm allowing some substance to pass this wall. And this wall is so thin 
that I can get things in and out. Now, when you start looking at simple cuboidal epithelium, you'll notice here um, you can see the simple cuboidal epithelium there. If you look this up in the textbook, it'll tell you where you tend to find simple cuboidal epithelium. You'll notice that you find it in tubes. Um, you'll find it in places like the thyroid gland, you know, surrounding um, um, follicles, which follicles are like large eggs that store substances in the body. So these cells oftentimes they line a tube like this could possibly be a tube right here. And what they've done is they've taken that tube and they split that tube in half. So you've taken that tube, you split it in half, and then you're looking at it lengthwise. So you had a tube like this, and you split it in half like that. And so you're looking at the inside of the tube when you're looking here. That's why it says that this is the lumen of a tubule. There is obviously a tube passing through here. I don't have the locations of these things in these notes. Uh, I should have loaded my other notes. but uh, I would or presume that this was probably taken from a, a kidney. It's probably a, a renal tubule, which comes from a nephron. There are these tubed microstructures in your kidneys that create urine. So substances pass through these tubes, and the simple cuboidal epithelium gives uh, minimal protection while at the same time allows you to add these substances into that tubule as it's floating by and then withdraw things from out of the tubule as it's passing by. So it's kind of like a little river that's passing through here and these cells are on both sides and some of the cells are fishing in the river to pull things out of the river while other cells are throwing things into the river. So uh, this that's, that's why this is a tubule, it's a tube substances are flowing through the tube. These simple cuboidal epithelial cells are on both sides. Some of them are secreting into the tube. In other words, they're dumping things into the river and then some of these cuboidal cells are um, absorbing or reabsorbing. They're fishing. They're taking things out of the, the tube. And so you'll notice that simple cuboidal epithelial uh, tissue these cells in this tissue, they tend to be in places like tubules um, and follicles, things, places where they can take things, put them in, and take things out. So columnar epithelium, this one's non-ciliated. Uh, they're, they're showing um, this substance, well actually they're showing this simple columnar epithelium um, in the jejunum. And you can see the lumen of the jejunum. They're highlighting it here. And then they're showing you the simple columnar epithelium here. Now exactly what is it that uh, I'm looking at? Well, the jejunum is actually part of your small intestine. Your small intestine is somewhere around 20 feet long. Most people, when you tell them that, they really don't believe you because they've never seen the small intestine. But there's a lot of folk out there who will not admit it, but they like chitlins. And if you eat chitlins, that is the small intestine of a pig. And so if you've ever seen the small intestine of a pig, that can give you a really good ex uh, idea of the small intestine of a human. The small intestine of a human is about 20 feet long. It's a very small pipe, um, very small, easily folded, and so it kind of it, it kind of balls up like a water hose that hasn't been put away correctly. It balls up and packs into your abdominal cavity. Um, and so you can really shove 20 feet of, of, of weak, thin tubing into one spot re real, in a really simple manner. So when you look on both sides here, especially in this image, you see the lumen of the jejunum. The jejunum, the jejunum is a segment of your small intestine. Your small intestine, out of that 20 feet, is broken into three different segments. The, the duodenum, also known as the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. 
the duodenum or duodenum, whichever way you want to pronounce it, is only like about 10 inches long. It's not very long. The jejunum, however, is about 8.4 feet long, with the ilium being a little over 11 feet long. So um, when you look at the jejunum, you're, you're almost 8.5 feet long of piping. And in the jejunum, the job of the jejunum is really to work on uh, absorbing, uh, helping to help digest and absorb uh, the food that comes in. So if you notice that on the, well, first let me show you the cells. Let's, let's look at the cells. You'll see the cells, and you notice that these cells are not flat. We're looking at these cells from the side. So it's kind of like you're looking at my face like this with a side profile. All right. So we're looking at these these cells from the side. When you were looking at simple squamous epithelial and we looked at the cells from the side, they were flat like this. All right. They were flat like my hand. But when you're looking at columnar epithelial cells, they're they're long, they're tall, all right? Because you're looking at them from the side as well. So so these are long, tall cells stacked together like pillars. And if I had long, tall cells that were stacked together like pillars, then I would assume that these cells are there for protection. That's that's a primary goal of them is, is going to be protection. You'll also notice that if you look down here at the bottom, you'll see these little tiny little they they colored them in light blue. You'll see these tiny little fuzzy things on the top surface, the uh, apical surface of the columnar cells, and these things are known as microvilli. Microvilli have a very important job in your small intestine. The microvilli lining these cells are trying to increase surface area so that you can rapidly absorb substances, which is what your small intestine wants to do. Every time you eat something and you digest it, it's not your mouth, it's not your esophagus, and it's not your stomach that does 90% of the absorption. What does 90% of the absorption that actually take your meal and get the nutrients to the rest of your body is your small intestine. If you, if you bypass your small intestine in the digestion process, most of the food that you eat, like 90% of it, it's going to go right out the other end and it's going to actually meet that Charmin or that Angel Soft that I was talking about in the um, explanation there um, underneath the video tab. So you're, you're not you're not going to you're not going to see that you're not you're not going to get that. Um, the small intestine is responsible for doing a major amount of absorption. So these microvilli are responsible for acting like vacuum cleaners that kind of suck up the nutrients as you digest them and as they travel through that lumen. That, so that lumen is kind of like a space that a river is running through and that river inside your small intestine happens to be made up of food. And so the smaller nutrients, as you break down that food to its smaller molecules, the microvilli can help you absorb it. But on the surface of this microvilli happen to be enzymes known as brush border enzymes. And the enzymes, it's almost like microvilli and the brush border are kind of like the bristles on a toothbrush. So you take the toothbrush and uh, the food comes along and the brush border microvilli, as the food goes by, it rubs or brushes enzymes onto the food, therefore breaking the food up even more, allowing the microvilli to absorb it, and then the columnar cells then take those nutrients and pass them into the bloodstream for you and me to actually manipulate and utilize. That's why people who are lactose intolerant, if they're lactose intolerant, it means that they are lacking the enzyme or the brush border enzyme known as lactase. You actually naturally produce an enzyme in your small intestine called lactase, and the purpose of lactase is to break down dairy sugar known as lactose. So a person who lacks lactase can't break down lactose, and so it can make them rather uncomfortable. Uh, the next sample we have here, uh, we can see simple columnar epithelium that's actually ciliated. 
So here are the cells and then uh, you'll notice that they're very tall. They take up a lot of room here and they make it a point to show us that these are ciliated. You notice that the edges are real fuzzy. That's the cilia that are sticking off of them. Now cilia are different from microvilli. I'm sorry, I keep moving the camera around. Um, like I said, it's been a long day. Um, and so I noticed that when it's been a long day, I get kind of restless. Uh, it's not ADD, but it, it's something. I can tell you that much. Plus, I'm thinking about these uh, loaded nachos I'm going to make after I get off this call. So um, the the uh, simple columnar epithelium, they're, they're, they are actually... Um, they actually have cilia on them for this image. You can see that they're ciliated because you can see the little fuzzy edges all around them. Cilia are not like microvilli. Microvilli, their purpose is to increase surface area so that you can absorb more stuff. Cilia don't do that. Cilia are finger-like projections that stick off of the surface of a cell whose purpose is to move substances across the surface of the cell. This sample, this tissue sample, is actually taken from a uterine tube, aka fallopian tube. You know, the two things sticking out off on the on the as horns on the on the uh, on off of the uh, the fundus of the uterus of the woman's uterus. So on a on a woman on a human female. Let me let me be clear with that because you go look this up with different mammals, female mammals, you'll see some crazy stuff. But for a female human, uh, she has she has two uterine horns or, or, or uterine tubes, uh, fallopian tubes that branch off of the fundus of the uterus, and one goes to the left and the other goes to the right. Inside the lumen of the uterine tube, um, you have the cilia, and what the cilia do is they 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 do this. Now you're probably like, okay, what's the problem with this? You know, it looks like he wants to throw up a west side, east side sign, but he's confused. No, what they're doing is they're they're moving like that, all right, like little like little little brooms. And what they're doing is they're sweeping a substance along. Now what's interesting is um in in a woman when uh when when sperm cells are traveling in the uterine tube, what those cilia will tend to do is they'll they'll try to sweep those sperm cells along to help get them closer to the uh, to the egg cell. Um, yeah, so you know once they get to that tube, they're home free. They they're all about finishing their mission. You know they they're they're going in like stormtroopers when they first land in the female reproductive tract. There's a lot of booby traps to keep them from getting to that uterine tube. We'll talk about that in some later videos. But once they actually get there, uh, the female body does a lot of different things to help those sperm cells get to that egg cell. This is just a side-by-side uh, -side comparison so you can see the difference between the cells. You can see the guy at the top. Here, let me let's blow this up just a little bit. You can see the guy at the top, they're flat. These are squamous cells. There's only one layer, so he's simple. One layer, simple. Uh, the shape of the cell is squamous, and the type of tissue is epithelium. Right here we see simple cuboidal epithelial cells or epithelial tissue. Uh, it's simple because it's one layer. You don't see them stacked on top of one another. It's simple. Cuboidal because they have a cube-type shape, and the type of tissue is epithelium. You move further down, the top is smooth, so they're non-ciliated. You've got only one layer of these cells. They're all stacked beside one another. They're not stacked on top of one another. So they're simple. They have a very tall disposition to them, so they're columnar, and the type of tissue is epithelium. And then these guys here at the bottom, they're fuzzy on the top, so they're ciliated. There's only one layer of them because they're stacked beside one another, not on top of one another. So it's simple. They're tall, so they're columnar, and then the type of tissue is epithelium. 
Now, two of the tissues, epithelial tissues, that are really confusing to people, and you know, I don't, I don't blame them, um, because it, it just, it just is, is a pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and pseudostratified. You got to break that name down. It says pseudostratified. Well, pseudo means false. Pseudo means fake. So, if something's fake. And it says fake for what? What is it faking? Well, stratified. So what it's doing is it's lying. It's trying to make you think that it's stratified, but it's not. It's pseudostratified. Columnar. What's columnar? Well, it's column shape. They're tall cells. And the type of tissue is epithelium. So you have pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So it looks tall. And it is tall, but it looks like it's stacked on top of one another, and it's not. So when you look here, they're telling us that it's located in the lumen of the trachea. In other words, in the tube of my voice, of my, uh, of my, 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 uh, my air, my wind tunnel. They have different nicknames for it, you know, but in the, your trachea. The, the windpipe, all right, the thing that all the way down to the piping that the bronch tubes that enter into your lungs, that windpipe, that trachea in the space, aligning the space inside that tube is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And you'll notice that it's ciliated. If you look in this picture, Here's the columnar cells. There's an image of a columnar cell separated here. And at first it's like, well, wait a minute, he's stacked on top of something. Uh, actually, he's not stacked on top of it. This is a this this is a difficult image for you to look at because really what's happening is kind of like taking a group photo. I, imagine this. And I'm used to this all the time. Imagine taking a group photo and they tell all the tall people to go to the back and all the shorter people to come to the front. Well, I'm a tall guy. I'm almost 6'6". So I always get sent to the back. Now, when I was in college, I could actually stand in the front because I was one of the shorter people in college. But in an everyday picture, it's very rare that I meet someone who's taller than me. So what winds up happening is I get sent to the back. Most of the people that are in that photo are probably shorter than me, so they get sent to the front. That's actually what's happening in this image right now that you're seeing that I'm waving the cursor around on. That little picture in the bottom right-hand corner is like a group photo, and there are some cells that are out towards the front. There are some cells out towards the back. And the ones in the back happen to be columnar cells that are tall, while the ones that are in the front are shorter cells. They could be goblet cells, which goblet cells release mucus, uh, which we all know that you make mucus in your windpipe. Otherwise, when you get a bad chest cold, you wouldn't be hawking up stuff, Yuck. which we call it phlegm. But on the surface of all of these cells, you'll notice that over here to the far left, bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that it's covered with cilia. And the cilia, remember what we said cilia do? Cilia, they do that. Yep, they're the sweeping brooms. They move things across the surface of the cell. That's what their job is, to move things across the surface of the cell. They're the sweeping brooms. So it's actually helping to move substances across the surface of your windpipe. Now, they're not just w moving in just any old direction. They're actually moving things up and out of your windpipe. So their desire is to actually push substances out of your windpipe and then out of you. So even though you have a chest cold and you're trying to hold things in, believe it or not, their goal is to actually help to push that stuff out. A second type of epithelial tissue is a stratified squamous epithelium. This is some weird stuff. Uh, sometimes it's difficult for people to really catch on to what they're actually looking at. So I'm going to see if I can zoom in here. 
for a second. Um, here you can see they've highlighted the stratified squamous epithelium. If you look closely in the purple version, you can see lots of squamous cells stacked on top of one another. It looks like a big giant lopsided stack of pancakes. Everybody kind of leaning over on everybody. And they're all stacked on top of one another. If you look over to the right, you have a lamina propria, which is a uh, soft layer that's directly underneath the stratified squamous epithelium. It kind of acts as like a glue layer or a basement layer below the epithelial tissue. But here's something more important. Here is one individual squamous cell. Can you see that highlighted in blue? So you have one of those cells, and that one cell is actually going to be stacked with so many more cells, which is going to make up the stratified squamous epithelium. Now you'll notice in parentheses it tells us that it's non-keratinized, and the reason why they're telling us that is because we can find this type of uh, tissue in very specific places. One of the places that you'll find stratified squamous epithelium that has not become keratinized is in the vaginal canal. Um, and so it doesn't have a rough, dry feeling to it. Um, it's non-keratinized because what it's done is it, it has not infused the cells with a protein called keratin, which you've probably heard of a protein called keratin if you dealt with skin care. Because in our skin, we have stratified uh, squamous epithelium, and the stratified squamous epithelium in our skin is keratinized. It's, it's what gives our skin um, that resilience against water and abrasive substances, whereas the, the, the surfaces in the vaginal canal and different soft tissue areas, that's a lumen. It's a space. All right, it's a space, but at the same time, the surface of that space is not keratinized. They're not hardened and infused with protein. Not like this image here, where we see stratified squamous epithelium, and you can see here where it clearly states that the stratified squamous epithelium that's keratinized is actually found in your epidermis, which your epidermis is actually the superficial layer of your skin. So it's the part that you actually come into contact with every single day. Here's some stratified cuboidal epithelium. You won't see much stratified cuboidal epithelium in the body. Usually when people talk about tissues, they rarely even talk about stratified cuboidal epithelium um, because it's not found in too many different places. We already talked about what um, cuboidal cells do, usually cuboidal cells are concerned with um, secretion and absorption. In this case, this thing is found in the parotid duct. And the parotid duct is actually a duct that you find attached to one of your salivary glands. You know, spit glands make saliva. So it's got this little tube that's running from the gland to, the, to an opening inside of your mouth. So these cells are responsible for secreting saliva. Uh, they're not responsible for absorbing that saliva, I can assure you of that. Uh, instead, they secrete saliva. It enters into the lumen, the open lumen of the parotid duct, and then it flows um, through the parotid duct into your actual mouth. Stratified columnar epithelium, that's another rare one. You really don't see um, too much stratified columnar epithelium at all. You, you, you really don't. It's, it's not in too many places. It's a very rare tissue just like stratified cuboidal epithelium is. However, you will see stratified columnar epithelial, epithelium um, with those, you know, those tall cells stacked on top of one another. You'll see them located in the urethra. Uh, or, or I should say uh, in the lumen of the spongy urethra, which the spongy urethra is only found in, in males um, when you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about the, the tissue itself. Um, 
and it's found in males due to the fact that males can have an erection and so the urinary so the urinary tract and the reproductive tract in the male they they're actually one in the same well well at least half the tract happens to be one in the same half of the reproductive tract is shared by the urinary tract and so um, there's this thing called spongy urethra that that passes through the uh, the penile tissue of the male and so it holds the whole it holds the space open so that substances can pass so um, this substance is is really this tissue is really there for protection um, not only from all the chemicals and, and substances that pass through um, but it's got to be there for strength and resilience um, but you know, you think about the fact that urine has to pass through this lumen every multiple times every single day, and urine isn't exactly the most friendly uh, liquid that your body cells can come into contact with. Transitional epithelium—that's a really weird one. Um, transitional epithelium is one of those tissues that usually gets people really bad on the test because they look at it and they're like, "What?" am I looking at can you please tell me this and so um, no offense I I'm on the side of the student when they're looking at transitional epithelium if you look at this you look at this transitional epithelium it looks like a whole bunch of just glob of cells just kind of stacked on top of one another it doesn't really look much like anything probably the first thing you want to say is that it's stratified but it's not don't even think of it as stratified. You typically find transitional epithelium in the bladder, the actual urinary bladder. Like it's lining the inside of the bladder. Here's the lumen or the space inside the bladder where you store urine. And then here's the transitional epithelium stacked right there. Now, here's the thing people look at transitional epithelium and they're like, I don't get it. Uh, I really don't. I'm not really sure I understand what I'm looking at. Well, let me tell you exactly what you're actually looking at. Have you ever seen, have you ever been to Golden Corral or Ryan's or some mom and pop restaurant and they have partitions? You know, the curtains? You know, the, the, the if you've ever been in one of those old churches that have like the uh, cafeterias in them where, where people all eat dinner after service, um, they have those partition curtains, you know, the things that you can pull out of the wall and you draw the curtain and it, it puts a, a wall from one side of the room and the other. Pretty cool devices. They still use them in hotel ballrooms and uh, in business rooms still today, except the partitions nowadays don't usually look like those drawing curtains. They're usually like walls that you can actually pull out of another wall. But my my point is is that these uh, the old partitions when you pull them out they were like accordions you know you pull them out and then they start stretching out stack by stack and they actually cross the, 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 the width of the room so that you could divide the room off and you could turn one room into two instantly uh, transitional epithelial cells are like that they are epithelial cells that are, cells that are stacked together like this and the reason for that is because your bladder, when it's empty, is, is, is a lot smaller. All those cells are bunched together. But when you begin to fill your bladder, those cells have the ability to stretch out like an accordion, like that partition. They, they are stacked together when the bladder is empty. But as you begin to fill that bladder and the wall stretches, you begin to separate those cells and those cells stretch out from one another. And it allows you to increase the size of your bladder without having to add anything or without having to take anything away. It's the perfect, it's the perfect tissue for the bladder because there you have the epithelial tissue. There's the transitional epithelial tissue right there. Uh, underneath it, you've got some blood capillaries there, so that's probably uh, loose connective tissue under here. And then on the surface here, inside the uh, 
inside the urinary bladder, you've got the transitional epithelial cells. And so what will happen is you'll fill that bladder, those cells will stretch out from one another, but then something magical occurs. What winds up happening is when you fill the bladder, it stays like this, and when you empty the bladder, the bladder shrinks back down to normal and the transitional L cells go back together just like a closed accordion or just like a partition wall that you slide back into its uh, storage space. So it may not look like it, but these are all cells stacked against one another, not just on top of one another. So what winds up happening is you pull those cells apart so that the, um, the bladder can expand, and then when the bladder empties, you push all those cells back together in one big clump. Okay, so uh, that is all there is to epithelial tissue and epithelial cells. Um, as you can see, we spent a lot of time just now on epithelial tissue. It, it takes a while to go through the epithelial tissue. Now we get the connective tissue, and um, connective tissue will take a, take, take a minute. So if you want to pause this, if you're watching this as a recording, you can pause this and, and go uh, do some laundry. Uh, and then, if you're watching this, you know, just just hang tight because we're gonna we're gonna hammer through this and just soldier on through. Um, when you start getting the connective tissue, one of the things that you have to pay close attention to, like in this image right here, this image is a uh, a picture of like um, is a composite image. You know, it's a composite image. What it's showing you is it saying, okay, in connective tissue, you can have any one of these things that you see in this image show up in that connective tissue. I'm going to need some more water for this. I can feel my voice going on me. Uh, you can probably hear it, those of you who, who've gotten used to my voice. Um, you can look at this connective tissue and you can see it. You can see the different things that wind up in connective tissue like this, uh, they talk about the extracellular matrix, which is the substance. Extracellular matrix is everything outside of the cells involved. That's extracellular. Extracellular is extra stuff aside from the cell. So extracellular, I'm looking at everything other than the cell itself. Um, so when you talk about connective tissue, if you say, okay, how do I, I, I understand how to identify epithelial tissue, but, but how do I identify connective tissue? I, I, don't, I don't really know that. Okay, three things. If you do these three things, you can identify any connective tissue on any lab exam. But if you don't do these three things, I'm telling you, it's going to be really hard. I've, I've watched people do this for years. I kid you not. Three things. Thing number one, find out what the specialized cell is. When you learn about connective tissue, generally you learn about some specialized cell that's in the connective tissue. What's a specialized cell? A specialized cell is a cell that has special functions. That's a specialized cell. A specialized cell is usually a cell, usually, okay, uh, usually. A specialized cell is usually a cell that is not planning on replicating anymore. It's, it's a cell that has uh, differentiated into its primary form. It is what it is. It is what it's going to become. And it has that specific, you know, that specific form. It's not like Dragon Ball Z where, you know, you have Goku and then you have Goku when he goes Kaioken and then you got Goku when he goes Super Saiyan and then he goes Super Saiyan 2, 3, and 4. And then, you know, don't forget fusion. You know, uh, it's, it's not where it has all these different levels and layers. A specialized cell is what it is. Once it becomes that thing, it is that thing. And it has very strategic, specific jobs that it's supposed to do within that tissue. And for some cells, outside of that tissue. So, number one, find a specialized cell. Number two, does this connective tissue have specific protein fibers? 
you'll notice in this image there are three protein fibers that are highlighted here. Protein fibers known as elastic fibers, collagen fibers, and reticular fibers. Now, uh, I don't like something that they did in this image. What they did was, at first glance, the elastic fibers and the reticular fibers look a lot alike. They are not. They do not have the same function. I'm going to go over the function of each one of these fibers so that you'll know them because you'll need to know them for future reference. Elastic fibers are exactly what they sound like. They're elastic. Okay? They're elastic, so they stretch. Elastic fibers are like the bands in your in your ath athletic shorts. They they stretch. They're kind of like socks, you know, they they stretch. All right? That's the purpose of elastic fibers. They stretch. It doesn't seem that important, but they're really cool because when they stretch, they return back to their normal shape and position. This is very important for different structures in your body, like skin. You should like and appreciate having elastic fibers in your skin because that allows your skin to stretch and then go back to its normal place and shape. Collagen fibers are the exact opposite. Collagen fibers don't like to stretch. Collagen fibers are not about stretching. They're about resistance. They're resilient. They're strong. They are strong enough for you to put and apply a lot of pressure on them and to be able to pull them. So you're going to find collagen fibers in things that want to be strong, things that have to go through a lot of pressure, things that have to go through a lot of stress. That's where you're going to find collagen fibers. They don't want to stretch, and if you pull them too much, they don't go back to their original shape and size. That's why people have stretch marks, because it's not because of the elastic fiber. It's because of the collagen fibers. That's why we develop wrinkles. It's not because of the elastic fibers. It's because of the collagen fibers. Reticular fiber is a very specialized protein fiber. Reticular fiber is most commonly found in reticular connective tissue. In other words, it's usually in soft organs. And what I mean by soft organs is these are organs that do not have muscle layers and bone and cartilage and things in them. These are organs that are literally soft to the touch, very pliable, easily damaged. Things like your liver, things like your spleen, you know, that that's a, a maybe a lymph node. Uh, something like that, a kidney, they have reticular fibers because these reticular fibers, they set up a network to form the framing of an actual soft organ. That's why everyone's liver just about looks the same and that's why if you see one kidney, you've seen them all because reticular fibers add framework and shaping to the soft organs of our bodies. So let me back out of this for just a moment. And then we'll zoom back in again. Remember what I just said. Number one, you want to find a specialized cell. Number two, you want to find what type of connective, uh, well, you want to find what type of protein fibers are involved. And then number three, you want to get to know about the matrix, the extracellular matrix. And what I mean by that is, is it solid? Is it liquid? Is it pliable? Is it rigid? You know? What kind of extracellular matrix does it have? The type of extracellular matrix that it has is going to dictate a lot with that tissue, a whole lot. I mean, a tremendous amount. So let's look at a few connective tissues here. We don't need to go through all of them, but there are several of them that we do need to hit on. For example, I'll take you to this one. Uh, let's go back to our normal shape and size. Areolar connective tissue, also known as loose connective tissue. It's a lot going on in this particular connective tissue. When you look at this connective tissue, you see collagen fibers. You see elastic fibers. Um, you see capillaries, which are really, really small blood vessels. You see mast cells, which mast cells are, uh, they are immune cells that are involved in immune response. Um, in, uh, in other words, uh, mast cells tend to release um, chemicals that cause you to respond to pathogens and invaders. 
kind of like histamine, you know, how how um, how cells release histamine and then you have an inflammation. Uh, so and then it's got a, a ground substance to it, and that ground substance is kind of gooey. If you've ever scraped your elbow, and you notice that after your elbow starts to heal, there's this sticky substance. You know, if you if you scrape your elbow and you take all the skin off, as the skin is trying to heal back, you'll notice that the coloration of the skin is kind of you know you got epithelial cells that are superficial to this. They're migrating back into the area, but it's sticky there. That's that ground substance that's inside the connective tissue that's underneath the epithelial tissue. Uh, in loose connective tissue, generally loose connective tissue is found directly underneath the epithelial tissue. And remember, epithelial tissue is always covering something. So when you look at floor tile, when you look at um, shingles on a roof, when you look at um, wallpaper, that's those are three perfect examples of epithelial tissue. They always cover something. Well, that's great that they're covering something. There's got to be something that sticks it and holds it down. That's the loose connective tissue. It holds that epithelial tissue down. Uh, collagen fibers and elastic fibers in there. If you got collagen fibers in there, obviously you're concerned about something being strong enough to take stress. If you're looking at elastic fibers, then obviously you want something to be resilient, but you want it to be, you know, have some give, you know, to it. Because if your skin didn't have elastic fibers in it, then every time you twisted your arm and moved your body, your skin wouldn't twist and bend with it along with the movement. And therefore, it would make your skin so rigid that your, your skin would be more like pork rinds. It would just crack crack right open, which would probably be extremely painful. The reason why you it looks the way that it does is because that space, that's actually not outer space, but <laughs> those are spaces there. That's why the ground substance is highlighted here. This is all uh, like a liquid gel. This is space in there, and there are substances in this space, you know. Um, there are blood vessels in here. There's collagen fibers, elastic fibers. There's uh, cells from your immune system. There's fibroblasts in there. Um, there are countless different other types of cells and substances that are all crowded into this space. You've got adipose connective tissue, which adipose connective tissue, if you notice here, um, is full of adipocytes. Each one of these squiggly spaces Notice that they show the nucleus of an adipocyte. They show capillaries in between the adipocytes, but they, they don't. <laughs> unfortunately, they don't highlight just one of the adipocytes. Instead, they highlighted all of the adipocytes all at once. Uh, adipose tissue is made up of adipocytes. There's not a lot more to this tissue than what you see. Adipocytes they actually store triglycerides in their cytoplasm. So, you know, uh, when you look at an adipocyte under a microscope, it has this yellowish tint to it. Um, it should have that tint to it because if you take oil and, like, if you take cooking oil, you go to fry something and you dump that oil, that grease in some water, you'll notice that the grease floats on the water and it gives off this yellowish, um, oily, oily, appearance. Well, adipocytes store triglycerides, and so they, they give off that oily appearance as well. Um, adipose tissue is used for like insulation for your body. The more adipose tissue you have, um, the more insulated you are, holds heat very well. So skinny guys out there, we wish we had some of your adipose tissue during the winter when it's really cold. Uh, adipose connective tissue also acts as a cushion. So um, around your soft organs, like your liver and your spleen, you find um, accumulations of adipose connective tissue, stored energy that, 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 that acts as a cushion and packages around those organs to, uh, to be able to absorb impact. You also, as a matter of fact, you know, a crazy place where you have adipose connective tissue is behind your eyeballs. 
You actually have it behind your eyeballs to cushion your eyeballs because there's nothing behind your eyeball but the eye socket itself, which is, is the skull. You know, it's a solid bone. So, you know, to keep your eyeballs from bouncing back and forth like a Tom and Jerry cartoon, you've got that adipose connective tissue there to act as um, a, a, a spongy type um, cushion. Here's the reticular connective tissue. Once again, we said the reticular connective tissue earlier is made out of reticular uh, protein fibers. And so this reticular protein fibers, they don't look like much in this picture. You can see a lot of ground substance here. Um, if you look closely at the bottom here, you notice that there are leukocytes that they highlighted around here. Leukocytes are white blood cells. The, the term leuco means white and site means cell. So you have white blood cells that are peppered throughout here. And then you have macrophages, which a macrophage is actually a type of white blood cell. Macrophages, macro means large, phage or phage, um, some people pronounce it different ways, phage or phage means eater, to eat. So macro Phage or macrophage means big eater. I nicknamed them cookie monster cells. Now, the last time I saw a Sesame Street episode, Cookie Monster was eating vegetables and promoting fruits and vegetables, and he was a, a vegetarian, which was kind of scary because dude's name is still Cookie Monster, and he's a vegetarian. Go put that together if you can. But back when I was up, Cookie Monster ate anything and everything that was on the table. As a matter of fact, he ate all your food, your cookies, and the table that the cookies were on. So when I see macrophages, I think about Cookie Monster because macrophages literally use their bodies to uh, wrap around a substance or a pathogen and draw that substance inside themselves. They engulf it and they destroy it and get rid of it. If I had to throw my poker chips on the table and make a bet, as to uh, what tissue, or what organ this particular connective tissue came from, I'd, I'd probably say that it came from a, a spleen. That's what I would say. This looks like this came from a spleen. Um, you've got white blood cells, you've got macrophages, because the spleen acts to filter blood. And one of the things that it does is it not only just filters the blood, but it pulls out dead and damaged red blood cells out of circulation. Um, and it can also fight off different pathogens that might pass through. Um, it, it removes a lot of damaged and broken um, debris that may be floating by. So, and these leukocytes and these macrophages, that's their job. Now, what holds that whole spleen together, even though it's a soft organ and doesn't have any cartilage or muscle or bone to really hold it together, you are now relying on this little framework, this little scaffolding connective tissue, better known as reticular connective tissue. Now, when you start moving up to the connective tissue that really gets its weight up, uh, you talk about dense regular connective tissue, you can look at how many collagen fibers this thing has. Do you see down here, do you see this? Do you see how much collagen this thing is made out of? You see all that highlighted? That's pretty much the whole connective tissue. It's all collagen. Whereas it's very minimal ground substance. See it highlighted there in blue? And then you see the nuclei of the fibroblast. Fibroblast, uh, fibro means fiber. Blast um, is actually into an immature cell. But the term blast not only refers to an immature cell, but when I was in school, blast also meant builder. And you'll notice that fibroblast help to repair and build um, protein fibers. So you've got fibroblasts that are kind of situated in, nestled in between the collagen fibers so that when you tear collagen fibers, uh, you've got something to help repair it. Now you'll notice that uh, it, in its name, it's not just, you know, the name is dense regular connective tissue. Well, if you haven't figured it out by now, the term dense really talks about its appearance because look, look at how densely populated the collagen fibers are together. They're densely packed together. But 
there's a term in there that refers to as regular. And the reason why it's called regular is you'll notice that the collagen fibers are in one pattern. All of the patterns are wavy and going in the same exact direction. No one's crossing over one another. All of them are going in the same pattern in the same direction. So we would find dense regular connective tissue in something like a tendon which connects a muscle to a bone so that when the muscle contracts it pulls the tendon and then the tendon pulls the bone that is attached to therefore pulling you and making you move so so you know since you have muscles pulling you around all the time you need something very strong really resilient that can pull and and, and yank things around and work constantly and that's dense regular connective tissue now of course if you got dense regular connective tissue, you got to have dense irregular connective tissue. It's got fibroblasts, it's got ground substance, it's got collagen fibers, just like dense regular connective tissue. The only problem here is that it's irregular in the sense of its uh, its pattern. Notice there is none. Now I know really artistic people are going to look at this and they're going to be like, ah, but there is a pattern. You can see it. It's no, 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 no. I don't mean an artistic pattern. I mean a a a an actual typical pattern. There's no there's no typical pattern compared to the dense regular connective tissue. So so and no no hate on my artistic people. All right, we're cool. Um, but there's no there's no really peculiar easy pattern to it. You might see some kind of pattern here in this image but when you look at it in the broad scheme of things there's no rhyme or reason to it uh, it's just set up there in every which way but loose so you've got connective tissue fibers these collagen fibers crossing over one another constantly like a big plate of spaghetti uh, and so what it's really there for is it's there for resilience and resistance Typically, we find dense, irregular connective tissue in places that you don't want to stretch. You, you don't. Uh, we find dense, irregular connective tissue in very specific types of ligaments. Um, ligament is type tissue in very small areas of the body. Elastic connective tissue, if you haven't already figured it out about elastic connective tissue, then I'll, I'll fill you in. Elastic connective tissue wants to be elastic. It wants to stretch. If you notice that the elastic fibers, here I'll zoom in. Here's the elastic lamellae. In other words, this is just layers of elastic connective tissue here. The elastic fibers, they're kind of in one general direction. They, they kind of have this squiggly appearance thing going on so that they can stretch out like an accordion and then kind of go back together when all is said and done. I'll tell you a place that you find elastic connective tissue. You'll find elastic connective tissue in between the vertebrae of your back. You'll find it in between the vertebrae of your back because when you bend over you actually stretch this tissue but you need something that's going to pull your vertebrae back into its normal configuration. Now when you start talking about cartilage, something you got to understand is that you got you actually got three different types of cartilage. Most of the time when we talk about cartilage, we just say cartilage and we go on about our business, but the average person doesn't know that you have three different types of cartilage. Usually people can tell you about um, one or two of them, but sometimes people can't tell you about all three of them. Like the first type of cartilage, this is still connective tissue. This, 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 this is still connective tissue. You've got hyaline cartilage. If you notice, remember what I said, you know, when you're looking at a connective tissue and you're not sure about it, find a specialized cell, look for any protein fibers, and pay close attention, attention to the matrix. Well, here's specialized cells, chondrocytes. Chondro, that word part chondro means cartilage. Site means cell, so chondrocytes are cartilage cells. They help to build and maintain cartilage, but they stay inside these little spaces, and these little spaces in the cartilage are called lacunae. Lacunae, actually, if you look that word up, lacunae means little room. So inside these little rooms, chondrocytes kind of live. 
and these spaces are suspended in the cartilage. Now, you and I both know that the matrix, the extracellular matrix of cartilage, is is not is is not liquid. All right, it's actually very resilient. It's kind of tough, so um, it's more like a, a more like a rubber, so to speak. It has a rubberish rubbery type um, consistency to it. Now, I, I'm not trying to be gross or anything, but if you've ever been eating a piece of chicken and um, you're eating like a chicken leg and there's this rubbery substance on the end of the chicken leg, the rubbery substance on the end of that chicken leg, um, a lot of times we call it gristle. Some people like it. Some people like to chew it and gnaw on it. Other people think it's nasty. Either way, the bottom line is that gristle on the end of that chicken bone is actually hyaline cartilage. That's what you're gnawing on. So it has a rubbery consistency to it. And in spaces inside are chondrocytes, which are helping to um, repair and maintain the cartilage itself. Hyaline cartilage is usually found in between bones. So like my elbow, I would find hyaline cartilage in between the humerus of my upper arm and the radius and ulna of my forearm. I would find hyaline cartilage in between the phalanges, in between the bones of my fingers. Uh, I would find hyaline cartilage in between the bones of my fingers and the metacarpals, which are in the palm of my hand. You find a lot of hyaline cartilage like in your knees, uh, in your knee joints, and in your hip joints uh, because they, they're, they're keeping bones from coming into contact with one another. So they, they minimize that bone-to-bone -bone, uh, contact. Now, fibrocartilage is on a whole nother level. Fibrocartilage looks nothing like hyaline cartilage, and um, if you look, it's got its own specialized cells, chondrocytes. They are still inside of little rooms called lacunae, and they are surrounded by collagen fibers. Um, fibrocartilage is more like um, it's it's like it's rubbery, but fibrocartilage has also has a gel like consistency on the inside of it. So a perfect example of fibrocartilage would be the intercalated, not intercalated, I'm sorry, I'm about to talk about something totally different, uh, intervertebral disc in between your, your vertebrae and your back. So you know when someone says they get a slip disc or a herniated disc, they're talking about these pads of fibrocartilage in between each one of their vertebrae. If they say they have a slip disc, they are saying that a pad of fibrocartilage is slipping out of place. Fibrocartilage is really good for dealing with pressure and, and more so the type of pressure that is uh, a compressing pressure. That's why you have fibrocartilage in your knees and in your back and in between your hip bones, your pubic bones, because they deal with a lot of pressure. But those discs are kind of like made out of rubber with a gel on the inside so that they can resist lots of compression forces against them. That's why um, a, a, when a woman is, is pregnant, why her uh, pubic angle can continue to spread apart because at the tips, here at the tips of my fingers, at the tips, that's where the, the pubic symphysis is. That's where you have a pad of fibrocartilage and it allows that hip to spread um, so that you can create the birthing canal. The third type of cartilage is elastic cartilage which elastic cartilage is, yeah, you guessed it, it's cartilage with lots of elastic fibers in it. So we can see the specialized cell, the chondrocytes. There's the special protein fibers, elastic fibers. And then there's the matrix, which is um, a little bit of that ground substance that's in there. And elastic cartilage, usually you find elastic cartilage in things like your ears. Your ears have, well, I got this, headset above uh, above there but your ears help to make up uh, are made up of a lot of elastic cartilage so when you you dissect a, a, an ear you find that it's very pliable I mean you can bend your own ears and you'll notice that when you bend and fold your ears they'll expand back out to their normal shape and size because of the elastic fibers that are in them uh, 
Bone is considered a connective tissue. Most people are shocked when they hear that, which is to be expected because it's weird. Compact bone and spongy bone are the two types of bone that we'll get into right now. Bone is some weird stuff because basically when you're forming bone, um, you actually start with cartilage or you start with some type, depending on the type of bone. Like with compact bone, what you do is when you're making compact bone, you start with a cartilage model when you're born. When you look at a little baby in the womb, when you look at a fetus, um, you know, little man's little hands, you can see the bones in his hands. Those, those bones are not completely formed yet. There's a lot of cartilage there that's shaped like bone. And then we convert that cartilage into bone. Compact bone is called compact bone because we take layers of bone and we compact the layers together. So a layer of bone may be as thin, if not more thin, than a sheet of paper. But we, but you, you already know a sheet of paper is very thin. It's very weak. It's not strong at all. But if you take an entire stack of paper and you make a phone book out of it, tearing that phone book in half is going to be a monumental feat of strength. It's very strong. That's what makes compact bone so strong. You're taking a very thin layer of bone, and then you're taking more and more layers of bone, and then you're stacking them together, and you make one big giant paper towel roll called an osteon. That's what you see here. Basically, in the middle of these osteons are central canals, and there are blood vessels running through this thing. And then the cells, the individual cells themselves, osteocytes, the osteocytes, surround the osteons, I mean, not the osteons, they, the osteocytes surround the central canals and they help to build what they call lamellae. And a lamella, a lamella or lamellae, which is plural, are just, just rings, concentric rings of bone. That's, that's all it is. So the osteocytes, they make the bone, but they make the bone in a concentric flat ring called a lamellae and they make several rings of this thing and when they make several rings of it they form it into one individual unit called an osteon. So basically when you look at an osteon, an osteon looks like a giant paper towel roll. We're looking at it from the top and it will be as long as like a paper towel roll is long and, and it's round just like the top of a paper towel roll and the layers are as thin as one sheet of the paper towel itself. And then we take these paper towels and then we stack them together <laughs> in like one bulk container and we make what's called compact bone. You'd find compact bone in like the bones in your legs, the bones in your arms. You know, the, the compact bone is in places where you need strength and you need something that's a weight-bearing bone. Whereas spongy bone is the exact opposite. I mean, when you look at spongy bone, it's like, what the heck am I looking at? Well, if you took someone's leg bone, like a femur, like the thigh bone, most of that bone would be compact bone. But if you broke it open and you looked at the ends of it, the ends of it would be mostly spongy bone. And inside spongy bone, you have spaces here, which these spaces are known as marrow cavities because they have bone marrow in them. So, the places like your, your sternum, um, inside of long bones like your femur, um, inside of flat bones like your skull, you can find marrow cavities where you make bone marrow. And it looks really, really weird. Uh, we're going to be talking about this more in detail when we get to the, uh, the bone chapter. We're about two chapters away from the bone chapter. We're going to discuss how you make marrow cavities and why it looks weird like this. They don't have osteons. They don't, have, they don't have osteons. Instead, they have these things called trabeculae. They're little struts and pillars of bone that kind of go in every different direction. And then the spaces in between, the spaces in between the trabeculae, you make bone marrow and store them there. Um, you have some connective tissue that is weird <laughs> because it's a liquid. Yes. We do consider your blood as a connective tissue. 
And the reason why we consider your blood as a connective tissue is it has specialized cells in it. Here's a sample of blood with erythrocytes. Erythro means red. Site means cell. So we have red blood cells in it. There are some neutrophils, which neutrophils are a type of white blood cell. Now you have more than just neutrophils as white blood cells in your blood, but in this particular sample, blood sample, there are just neutrophils here, and neutrophils are actually white blood cells that attack bacteria. And then you have a cluster of platelets sitting over here, which platelets are not alive in humans. Platelets are cell fragments that we use to stop bleeding. So you've got all of these things inside of blood, but what makes blood very unique that you don't see in this image is it has um, fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is actually another type of protein fiber. Now you can't see fibrinogen here in the image because the fibrinogen really, when it's in your blood and it's flowing in your blood, fibrinogen is dissolved. It's dissolved in the blood. Um, but when you activate, activate fibrinogen, fibrinogen turns into fibrin, which is a solid substance. And that solid substance causes the blood to turn solid, and it causes it to form a blood clot. So now you've got this solid substance formed from specialized cells, protein fibers, that makes a solid matrix. Ah, so yeah, so now you see why it's a connective tissue. Okay, so that wraps up connective tissue and epithelial tissue. Good grief. Are you tired yet? Because I kind of am, and I'm getting really hungry. So let's go ahead and wrap things up because we only have just about four or five slides left. Um, that's all the epithelial tissue. That's all of connective tissue, which leaves us with muscle. So when we start looking at muscle tissue, remember I told you earlier at the beginning of this video, there's only three types of muscle tissue that we're looking at. Skeletal, cardiac, smooth muscle. Their locations are different, their appearances are different, and their functions are different, hands down. So when you're looking at muscle tissue, you can't, you can't use the rules from epithelial and connective tissue. You got to pay close attention to the fact that they are located in a different place, their functions are different, and by all means, they do not look alike. I do not know why people get them mixed up. You got to look at these very clearly. For example, if you look at this skeletal muscle, ignore these band things over here. We will talk about that later. I want you to just focus on the skeletal muscle itself. This is one skeletal muscle cell right here, this thing. That's one cell. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. They didn't have to magnify this but so much for you to be able to tell that this is a skeletal muscle cell. They didn't magnify it much at all. It, 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 skeletal muscle cells are just simply that big. As a matter of fact, that's not the whole cell that you see there in that, in that image. Okay, That is a small portion of the actual cell that you see in this image. The rest of the cell cannot fit in the actual image. So we're left just looking at a section of the skeletal muscle cell. When you look at skeletal muscle cell, if you've ever seen a, a, a straw, think of a straw and that's kind of the shape of skeletal muscle cells. Oftentimes we call them skeletal muscle fibers because they're meant to contract and pull things just like a rope. Um, skeletal muscle fibers have protein fibers inside of them, and that's actually what gives it this striated appearance. The striated appearance is from the protein fibers that are inside that helps the skeletal muscle cell to contract. And of course, skeletal muscle cells are located in skeletal muscles, which allow our bodies to move. Now, when you look at the second type of muscle tissue, this is cardiac muscle tissue, and if you take a very good look at cardiac muscle tissue, it does not look anything like skeletal muscle tissue whatsoever. Now, uh, cardiac muscle tissue is striated. It is striated. It has something in it that none of the others have. They have these little things here in the middle called intercalated discs. 
Now, I'm pointing out these intercalated disks because I need you to understand something here. I'll zoom in a bit. Oops, went over too far. Intercalated discs attach one cardiac muscle cell to another. Skeletal muscle cells run the length of the actual muscle, so they're, they're ridiculously long. Cardiac muscle cells are only located in one place, the heart. So uh, a cardiac muscle cell might only be this long. And so it will, it will start here, it will end here, and then another muscle cell will begin. And so they're interconnected by intercalated disc. Intercalated disc keep the contraction cycle going. Intercalated disc allow cardiac muscle cells to communicate with one another so that they know when to contract next. Let me zoom back out. Another thing that you'll notice about cardiac muscle cells is that they're branched. They're not just straight like straws. Instead, they're branched. You'll notice that it this, this cardiac, you can really see it in the one at the bottom. Hold on. You'll notice that in this cardiac muscle cell, part of him will go this way and part of him goes that way. It's branched. It splits off. It literally it splits off. They're not very long. This is one complete cell here, and this is one end, and that's the other ends. And so this cardiac muscle cell goes this way, la, 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 and then it splits and branches off into multiple directions, which skeletal muscle cells do not do that. The last type of muscle cell we have is smooth muscle. And if you look at smooth muscle, you'll notice something. You notice that it's smooth, all right? Very smooth. There's no striations. There are no lines. It's called smooth muscle because of its smooth appearance. Now, when you look at it, you know, here's the smooth muscle fibers. You see that? They highlighted some over here. They highlighted some over here. They're kind of flat. They're smooth. No lines. No striations. So it's very smooth. You'll notice that there's smooth muscle fibers running this way in a longitudinal direction. And there's smooth muscle fibers running in a transverse direction. In other words, the smooth muscle fibers that are running longitudinally are going this way. They're going across. But when you go down the screen a bit, you'll notice that the smooth muscle fibers are running transverse, which means they're running this way. So they're crossing over one another. They cross over one another like that due to the fact that smooth muscle does not contract like skeletal muscle or like cardiac muscle. Instead, the same way you squeeze toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube, that's the way smooth muscle works. Smooth muscle, it squeezes behind a substance and then propels that substance forward. So when you look for smooth muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue is typically found in hollow organs like a stomach or an esophagus or small intestine or a large intestine. It's found in hollow organs that we don't typically voluntarily control because what's going to happen is that smooth muscle wants to contract, make things, it wants to contract, and it wants to propel and push things forward through a tube. And it uses a wave-like contraction um, pattern known as peristalsis to actually move that substance from one point in the tube to the other point in the tube. That leaves us with the last tissue type, which is nervous tissue. And here's an image of nervous tissue. And I bet you by golly, you're not going to forget nervous tissue. We don't spend much time in nervous tissue when you start talking about tissues in a class because nervous tissue usually gets an entire chapter to itself and I can promise you we're gonna have a couple of videos on nervous tissue um, I say a couple we're probably gonna have several on nervous tissue just to help explain what's happening in nervous tissue this is a fascinating image of nervous tissue in the last image that we're gonna talk about in this video here you can see there's two neurons here's a neuron on the left and a neuron on the right they look like some type of octopi, some strange animal that you find deep in the water. 
this this new neuron and that neuron and you notice that it has extensions from itself if you look in these images it they 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 highlight the actual neuron here these strange looking cells and then they highlight the dendrites on these neurons dendrites are appendages on a neuron that allows it to receive information whereas you look at the image below it highlights their axons this is how they send information out so dendrites are how they receive information axons are how they send information out uh, the nuclei um, of glial cells are other types of nervous tissue cells that surround the neurons they have an entirely different job the sole purpose of a neuron is to communicate that's the job of neurons neurons send signals receive signals so that you can compile and comprehend information and come up with a complete uh, thought or com complete command glial cells don't do that glial cells their sole purpose is to do everything else in that tissue that's necessary to heal the tissue to get rid of the debris to attack pathogens to do everything in that tissue that's necessary uh, outside of what the neuron does which the neurons responsibility is to send signals um, neural tissue is very delicate can be easily damaged that's why you know I hate to say it but a lot of people a lot of kids probably wouldn't do as many drugs as they did if they went back to the old school methods of showing kids what happens to your brain when it really is on drugs uh, if you saw how neurons die and, and if you could see the fact that your level of comprehension cognitive thought and memory and emotional tolerance all begins to drop when you're on these drugs um, then then you'd probably lay off some things I mean you've you've been under the influence of over the counter medications or things you got from the drugstore you felt like you were coming down with a bad cold you took some medicine and the side effects made you really drowsy they they impaired your ability to drive or stay awake those are chemicals that are affecting these cells you're you're sending chemicals to interfere with the way that these cells function and uh, even though they're side effects that's just what those chemicals actually do so uh, that's all we got time for tonight we're done with this thing we're wrapping it up these are the four major classifications of the tissues and these are the sub classifications of all of these tissues so uh, that's all we've got for you guys if you got any questions you can post them on the site um, look us up on Google Plus at any time under the Professor Nixon. As a matter of fact, um, if you want to look us up on YouTube, you can go to the to our the Professor Nixon channel. Check out some of our other videos. Let us know what you think. Let us know how you like them. What are some things you'd like to see added? And aside from that, we'll talk to you guys later.